Music. It's the love of music that brings us together. The love of music that forms the bond between us. For the next hour, join us for the love of music, presenting those aspects of music which excite, provoke, and inspire. Our host today is David Dubow, WNCN music director, pianist, educator, and writer on music. Here is David Dubow for the love of music. This is David Dubal, and today, in the great halls of WNCN, my guest, Quentin Crisp. Quentin Crisp is not a pianist, not a violinist, but he is an expert on many things, including life. And life takes in performance. Now, performance is something that we hear all the time because we play people that perform. Quentin we have a lot to say and we have a lot to talk about because on December 17th you open in a new play by Professor Eric Bentley. It's called Lord Alfred's Lover and obviously it's about Oscar Wilde, right? That's right. It's about Oscar Wilde. I play the part of the elderly Lord Alfred uh -huh. and I sit beside the stage and explain the action which goes on on the stage between... Um, the young Lord Alfred, Oscar Wilde, and various other people. Yes. So you go from just before his um, arrest to the time when he is about to die in the middle of Paris. Now, Oscar Wilde died in uh, approximately 1905, correct? No, in 1900. 1900, even earlier. So he was quite a young man, actually, when he he died. Probably about 42. Most people just have no idea then how young he was and how much then he accomplished in a short life, including touring America and so forth as a lecturer. Now this play by Eric Bentley will be opening December 17th. It will have a run until January 9th. It will be at the New Vic Theater in New York City, which is at 13th and 14th Streets on 2nd Avenue. And I truly encourage the audience to go see this play because Quentin Crisp is quite an actor. Now tell me, Quentin, when did you begin your career as an actor? I know that I know you as a writer and a speaker. Well, I didn't really ever have a career as an actor. I have been in two or three movies, which I think it would be polite to call experimental. Mm -hmm. The last of these was called Hamlet and was made by a man called Mr. Coronado. Worse, Celestino Coronado. <laughs> and... If you didn't know the story of Hamlet, you couldn't follow the film. It is a series of lurid images explaining Mr. Coronado's view of the complexities in Mr. Hamlet's character. Mm -hmm. The man playing Mr. Hamlet was naked throughout the play, <laughs> um, which is another kind of modernism. Yes. But it did have an ace in the hole, which is that Hamlet was played by the Mayer brothers and future generations will sit up all night wondering how the double exposures were done. Oh, interesting. But there aren't any. Uh, the Mayer brothers look exactly alike. Quentin, you have said that performing, the act of performing is a very important activity. What do you mean exactly? Well, the situation in which you find yourself if you're a solo performer is that you are the one among the many. Mm -hmm. And as I see it, this is the only thing that the stage can now do, which the movies cannot do. When you're acting, when you're pretending to be in some situation involving other people, it's much better done on the movies. Mm -hmm. The movies are perfect, even when they're perfectly awful, they're still perfect. Mm -hmm. The stage is subject to accident. Mm -hmm. And the only thing this stage can add is this confrontation between the person on the stage and the people not on the stage. So this is what I have tried to involve myself in, is this idea that I will explain myself to the audience. And this I began to do in 1975, 
because I had an agent who took a theatre, which was a room behind a public house. And in England there are opening hours. He knew what he had taken the room for, which was to put a show on in the evening. But you get stuck with lunchtime opening hours, which are between about half past twelve and three o'clock. And not wishing to waste the space, he suggested that I should go on the stage. And when I said, with what object, my good man? Hmm. He said, you could talk to people. Yes. And so this is what I've done ever since. And you love it, don't you? Yes, I do like it. I like to be with people. If I ever had an ambition, it was to meet everybody in the world before I die. And you come nearest to doing this if you go on the stage. I want to ask you this. Now, you you came to fame, celebrity, uh, not through your autobiography called The Naked Civil Servant, which is a wonderful book and which will be out again in paperback. It's out of print this moment, but in the spring it shall be out again. And you have written other books, but you have become famous through that amazing thing called film. And uh, they took your autobiography, The Na Naked Civil Servant, Thames Television, and they made this into a, a wonderful um, hour-long or more, I think, uh, presentation. And it's played there, and it's played in America. And I know that, and I'm wondering if it, if it surprises you, because... On the street, you are recognized instantly. People come and talk to you. You have struck a chord. I don't know about England, but a definite chord in the psyche of New York City and perhaps America. Yes, this is, um, this is to some extent true. It wasn't until the television uh, program was shown in England that my life altered significantly. The book altered it a little. I started to go and speak to groups of people who wanted to know how to write books or whatever. But it wasn't until the television play was shown that my life altered to the point where I went on the stage, even on to what in London are called West End stages. It's difficult to explain the West End. It is a mythical region to which the eyes of tired touring actresses are forever turned. <laughs> and they say, we, we may come to the West End. And that mm -hmm. means that you then triumphed. <laughs> and I've been on two stages in the West End because, really, I am a, the ideal stopgap. If you have a play on which fails, what you want is someone who can go on tomorrow. No scenery, no rehearsals, no lighting calls, no anything. Mm -hmm. no, you just say, all right, I'll do it. When shall I start? And if they said in ten minutes' time, you could go straight on. Mm -hmm. So this is what is useful from the point of view of theatre managers. But it's useful in life, isn't it, to be able to just graze, to be able to improvise? Yes. Few people now have that because we're, we seem to want and need to plan everything out. Life isn't planning, is it? Well, it becomes, performances become planned. Mm -hmm. That is to say, when I did it for uh, seven weeks on, continuously, uh, then I found myself standing in the same position on the stage, wearing the same expression and saying the same things in the same way. Yes. It becomes more refined yes. as time goes by. Less exciting, though? Well, in a way, m more, less hazardous. Uh, the exciting part of the show is that the second half is given over to the audience, who in the interval are encouraged to write down their questions, which robs them of their shyness. Uh -huh. It's quite difficult for some people to stand up, even in a theatre that holds only 500 people, and speak loud enough for you to be, to be heard on the stage. Yes. So, um, and also they've got their husbands sitting beside them saying, don't make a fool of yourself, yes. and <laughs> trying to get them to sit down. <laughs> so that is hazardous. But if they write down their questions, then they needn't be identified with them if they don't want to. Mm -hmm. And also, when you've read out the first two or three questions and answered them, the audience knows that you will answer seriously whatever question is asked.
Mm-hmm. They yes. don't have to be profound. They don't yes. have to be witty. And you do answer them seriously. And I've uh, heard these performances and talks, and I wish I could every day because that's how much fun and enlightening they are, Quentin. My guest is Quentin Crisp, and the first time we talked, we were saying to each other, um, I said, well, do you, do you like classical music? And I think you said, oh, I don't know a thing about it or something like that. That's right. To <laughs> me, there is really no such thing as classical music. Uh-huh. There's only the noise you like and the noise you don't. Yes. I think we must remove from our lips the words good music. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, do you read good books? I mean, this mm-hmm. we do not want. Yes, because, you know, of course, it, that term classical music has gotten music into such trouble. I mean, really, the separation again. It's, it's so interesting. So say that again, the noise you like and the noise you don't like. That's all there uh-huh. is. And music is, of course, rhythmical sound, noise. Uh, but the performers are awfully interesting, not only in the classical world, but in all kinds of music. And they become cult items. And some of them get in a little trouble when they cross over because the first performance we're going to hear is by a man that you know of, Jose Iturbi. And he's going to play a Spanish piece. He made some fame as a Spanish interpreter. But he got in trouble when he took his celebrity as a, quote, classical artist and took it to the movies where he became then a a box office celebrity. Now, the classical music profession never again felt too good about him. Let me hear a, a, a thing or two about Iturbi. Did you ever hear him play? Or I saw the movie. Uh-huh. The movie is called Thousands Cheer. And in it, he played the joint is really jumping down in Carnegie Hall. <laughs> yes. And this, I think, was probably what distressed your little friends. <laughs> but, of course, it's wonderful to hear that kind of piece played by a man with such extremely strong wrists. Yes. Because it becomes sharper, harder, clearer. And it is that slightly cruel element in jazz, Mm -hmm. which is its very essence. Yes. Cozy jazz is a waste of time. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. What an interesting thought. Uh, We're going to hear Iturbi, who uh, had such a big film career and a conducting career, and he's going to be playing a piece by a man called Isaac Albanis, 1860 to 1909, so he didn't live too long. He left home at four years old, believe it or not, and traveled all around as a, he was a tremendous prodigy. No, at seven years old, at four, he played in public for the first time, and uh, he left and he, he played in cafes in Cuba. And then they found him and they brought him back through New York and then back to Spain, and he wrote a tango in D major, which is a famous tune. Now, I don't know, as we were talking before, if this is the tune that the Argentines use for their national anthem, because you told me their national anthem is a tango. Yes, it is. Well, it's a good form, the tango. And we're going to hear Jose Turby play Albanath Tango in D.
You have just heard Albaneth's Tango in D Major, Opus 165, number two, played by the late Jose Iturbi, who died a couple of years ago. Uh, right after these messages and words, I will be back with my guest, Quentin Crisp. This is David Dubal. Today, my guest is Quentin Crisp, writer, speaker, and the author of two books on style. What a word. How to Have a Lifestyle and Doing It with Style. And Doing It with Style is by um, a co-author, too, uh, Donald Carroll. And that's published by uh, Franklin Watts, am I right? That's right. Well, that's quite a book. And your uh, How to Have a Lifestyle is a wonderful book that I read of essays of, oh, Oscar Wilde. And Oscar Wilde um, will be the subject of Lord Alfred's Lover. Which That's is the right. play you open in at the New Vic Friday the 17th. Do you ever get worried that you're going to um, not have a success or whatever? I worry if I'm in a play because I worry for the sake of the other people. As I'm much too old to be able to learn lines, I tend to leave out lines or say the lines in a different order. Mm -hmm. And this is very worrying for other people on the stage with you. Uh -huh. If I'm by myself, I have nothing to lose. Yes. Quentin, and that is wonderful uh, because the, the being alone has something very, very wonderful about it. it yes. You're all on your own then. Uh, but what is this phrase, you're too old to learn Lines. You do become too old to keep them in your head. A lot of actors say they can learn the lines, but then they forget them almost immediately. Mm -hmm. And this is part of the process of growing old. But I don't think that you think ever of really growing old, because life is, it presents itself at this moment, and this moment is life. And this is true, but of course you are aware of your physical deterioration. Yes. And this you have to accept and even make the most of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk of other performers on this program. Um, one that is especially interesting to you, I think, because we discussed her. She was the most famous, probably, ballerina that ever lived, Anna Pavlova. Yes. Did you ever see her? I did indeed. I saw her dance, the famous dance called the Californian Poppy. <laughs> and as long as she stayed on her point, she really didn't have to do much else. There weren't any wild steps in it by any means. And this was, of course, part of her art. She was not, even by the standards of those days, a great dancer. Right because she hadn't the physical strength. Mm -hmm. But so she made the most of her limitations. She embraced her weaknesses. And this she did by parading her frailty. She appeared in a spotlight, alone, on huge stages, wearing white and looking white. Mm. And the great part of her performance was that she looked as though she wouldn't get through the evening without a blood transfusion. Mm -hmm. This is what the English audiences wanted to see, this person who had sacrificed herself for her art. For ballet, and she brought this, this dance form everywhere. People that had never heard the name ballet were seeing Pavlova dance in places that nobody had ever even gotten to from 1910 till into the 20s she toured the world there was no place with a stage that she didn't go to yes she did take a whole troupe which meant taking scenery and she took them all over the world she lived in the grand manner she was the paderewski of dance yes i think she was why do, do some people have this sense of style that it goes beyond even their technical capacity. For instance, Paderewski could not play as well as his contemporaries physically, and yet he just drove the crowds wild. The same with Pavlova. It is, I think, a knowledge of yourself. The great pianists or the great 
musical people of any kind. Their main knowledge is their knowledge of the works they're playing. Mm -hmm. With the great performers, their study has been their study of themselves and how to appear to great advantage. You're, most of them have physical advantages. Uh, Mr. Itobi, whom you mentioned earlier, was a handsome man. Yes. Mr. Paderewski was a significant-looking man. Very. He could, he could actually become, and did, the president of Poland. Yes. Think of a pianist ruling a nation. Mm. How dangerous. That's right. <laughs> and with Pavlova, she had this beautiful, frail look. And they were aware of this, mm -hmm. and they cultivated it, and this is what made them great performers. And you know when a performer is greater than the performance, if they are known to people outside their profession. Yes, absolutely. You could have gone on to the stage in the early 30s and said to someone who was dancing, who do you think you are? Pavlova, yes, and the audience would have laughed. Yes, without any film, so to speak, without recordings, Pavlova's name is as famous today worldwide as any living dancer. Oh yes, Paderewski still continues to be of interest to people. A new biography was just written. Now you said something about the idea she looked so pale in a blood transfusion. Paderewski had this too. He was the ideal aesthetic-looking character that the 90s, especially the 1890s in, uh, in, in London, loved to see. When Burne Jones, the great painter, saw him from uh, a carriage, he said, oh my goodness, an angel, I must draw him. And indeed, he, he, he did do a magnificent silver point of him instantly. Things change, though, even in style of how, how a public appreciates uh, the, the consumptive Virtuoso is no longer in fashion. The the uh, the more muscular type, the the Marlboro man. Am mm. I right? There's changes yes. in fashion. Oh, and there's changes in fashion um, as to what is personal beauty. Mm -hmm. This goes on all the time. What's our thinking now on personal beauty? Uh, that it is sexual. Uh huh. Um, Sex, the word sexy would have been a term of blame in a time gone by. Oh, interesting. No one would have said they look sexy mm -hmm. and meant it as praise. Mm -hmm. So that um, this is one of the, the main differences, of course, in um, the idea of beauty are in the idea of a woman's beauty mm -hmm. because they spend a great deal of time um, altering their appearances, altering their entire shape mm -hmm. and their hair and either not wearing makeup because that's gone out or wearing makeup because it's come in again. Mm -hmm. And this goes on forever and ever. I'm at the moment reviewing a book called American Beauty mm -hmm. by a Miss or Mrs. Banner. And she describes these changes between the idea of being spiritual or the idea of being the new woman, in uh -huh. other words, having a more useful view of life, mm -hmm. which altered their appearance, the, the clothes they wore, everything. How interesting. We're going to interrupt this talk to actually now hear one of the most famous pieces of music in the world. And perhaps it's not because it's such an important piece, but it has such a wonderful title, The Swan. It's by Saint-Saëns, and it was one of the real triumphs of Pavlova's career. She was indeed that dying swan, wasn't she? That's right. And the world wanted to see her die on stage, and she did it everywhere. Anna Pavlova will now dance for us in The Swan, from the Carnival of Animals by Saint-Saëns, and the cellist is the great Jacqueline Dupré.
that was Pavlova dancing for us. And if we just closed our eyes for a second, we could actually see this illusion of the tutu and everything. Right, Quentin? Yes, indeed. Quentin, we'll be right back after a few messages from our sponsors, and we'll continue talking about what you do. My guest today, the celebrated writer, stylist, and really quite a wonder, Quentin Crisp, who now lives in New York City. How did that happen? It um, happened piece by piece. Uh -huh. I never saw America except in the movies until 1977. I can never travel anywhere unless my fare is paid. So I came at the invitation of Mr. Bennett. And I only stayed two and a half days. I then came the following year to work in MacDougall Street. And the year after that, I went to Los Angeles and worked there. And in 1980, I set about becoming a resident alien which is all I am anywhere in the world, really. Mm -hmm. And I was allowed to come here in May of last year. But I didn't, in fact, manage to collect everything I could carry until September. And then I came, and I now live here with luck forever and ever. With luck forever and ever. When I first met you, I said, oh, it's cold out today, and you said... It's always summer in America. What does that mean? Well, it is, of course, much more sunny in America than it is in southern England. Uh -huh. The winters are shorter, sharper, and colder. Here. Here. Yes. But even when it's cold, it's frequently bright. Mm -hmm. The summers are hotter than they are in England. Uh, which surprised me. Otherwise than that, oh, and the rents are higher, mm -hmm. but otherwise than that, it's an ideal place. New York is the ideal place to live. Is it Baghdad on the Hudson? Yes. Where it, everyone is a performer? It is indeed, yes. Uh -huh. It's amazing how totally the city is given over to the idea that happiness is the same thing as success in the world of entertainment. <laughs> but you say it's the ideal place to live, Manhattan. Oh, yes. And why ideal? Because everybody in America is your friend. <laughs> everybody talks to you wherever you are. Whether you sit and you want to meet everyone. Oh, yes. How did that happen, That this openness, this lack of fear? Uh, I suppose as soon as I got here, and found that the world was not hostile. You see, in England, people are hostile. Really? What do you mean by that? Oh, in England, I receive phone calls threatening my life almost every day. You're a threatening person in England? Um, I think the English uh, do not really like the idea that you might be free of the laws, rules that bind other people. I see. I don't break any laws, but I don't abide by any conventions. And even that wouldn't matter if I could be seen to be flouting the conventions. Yes. But you see, I'm just ignoring them. Mm -hmm. And this is what worries people. Mm -hmm. Like you're getting away with something. In I light. think they feel you're getting away with something. Mm -hmm. Well, people don't like that. Uh, you said something about, to me once, an inward spiritual flame. Do you think that a whole population can be characterized with having that or not having it? Do you think America has an inward flame? And to a much larger extent than anywhere else I've ever been. Mm -hmm. But no, I don't think that will ever be a national characteristic. <laughs> national traits. Um, immediacy is the national style of America. Obediency. Mm. Uh -huh. And what does that mean? That means that what they want, they want now. Mm -hmm. And they are prepared to ask for it, and ask for it now. Mm -hmm. And, and what, is the na what is the asking for what? The music, the, the food, wh or what is it they want? 
they want to know what life is like. Mm -hmm. They want to know an answer. They want to be told some way in which they can triumph over the limitations of their lives. Mm -hmm. So the Americans have a transcendental gene in them working. I think they have, even when they don't recognize it. Mm -hmm. The mere theory that anybody can be president is already something that stirs the imagination, though I'm sure not one person in a thousand wishes to be president. Or really believes it. Or perhaps mm -hmm. even believes mm -hmm. it. But they do feel that their life is open-ended. Mm -hmm. Open-ended, that's interesting. Uh, that well may be the, the great inner optimism that keeps it, uh, that keeps it very creative here mm. in many ways. Yes. I've often thought that this America is uh, the microcosm of the world. Everything that is going to happen anywhere will happen here first. Yes, I think this is true. Yes. Now, why, Quentin, have you touched the cord in so many people here. I have said, have you heard or read Quentin Crisp? And in all walks of life, people are, uh, they're very involved with you. They, they like you. They, they want to know what you think. They listen closely, as I do. Well, they say in America that my books are how-to books for losers, and they are. Uh -huh. It is the fact that you do not have to triumph. Uh -huh. which I think perhaps to some people I represent, that I do not have any money uh -huh. and that this does not worry me, that um, I am in certain quarters regarded as a disgrace. I don't think this matters. <laughs> and people, I think, feel, well, if this is so for anyone, it could also be so for me. Mm -hmm. Perhaps I represent someone who hasn't... Um, either found or even sought the ordinary standards by which people mm. tend to live. You have again then found a loophole, another way of surviving. Yes. Certainly you have never thought of, of uh, working nine to five for 60 years straight or whatever. You, uh, you have a certain freedom that people then probably admire. Uh, and yet uh, you're not envied. People gravitate to you. Yes, I'm not, I think, envied. And I never would represent myself as having anything that anybody else wanted. Mm -hmm. I make it clear that what I say you should do will only bring happiness. It won't bring anything else. Mm -hmm. I said to you, can I show you the station? And you said to me, I only want to see what you want to show me. What is this accommodating spirit? about because it seems to be it seems to be uh, almost a philosophy yes my agent says i've raised passivity to the level of an art form <laughs> and uh, this i have certainly tried to do oh. of course there is a limit to how much you will um put up with from the world or from other people but i try to make the limits as far away as possible mm. I try to know what I would not do fairly clearly so that I never assert my will in situations where in fact it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I would hate to get into a, into a situation where I had insisted on something and later thought, I don't know why I made all that fuss, I don't care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that I never think, oh, I'm being overlooked. Nobody consulted me. Mm -hmm. Why wasn't I asked? Mm. I think first, does it matter then whether I was asked or not? Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't, keep quiet about it. There's much in that phrase, what does it matter? Yes. Yes. Uh, we're going to talk about a woman that you brought up to me, and one of the things that intrigues me, of course, is is so many perceptions on that you have on, on performance itself. And I... Th brought up a, a, a woman pianist that I thought nobody had heard of in America. Her name, Harriet Cohen. And you, you have heard her play. Yes, indeed. And she was the great performer in the sense that, first of all, she had these beautiful Byzantine looks. Mm -hmm. Then she dressed in a way that was never flashy, but was always extremely visible. Mm-hmm. 
uh, she had the art of arriving on stage mm. absolutely um, to at her fingertips. Mm -hmm. She would wait till the audience was just about to become restless, but hadn't yet become annoyed. Mm. Then she would appear on stage, but never fast. She always appeared to be arriving in her own good time. Yes. Then there was a pause in which she bowed, I think, first to the conductor. Mm -hmm. And she gave him a grave look, as though music were a friend that both of them had known who was now dead. <laughs> then she bowed to the audience. Then she went sit down. But then there was the rearrangement. Her dress flowed out behind her somehow as she sat down to cover the maximum amount of the stage. Oh. Then she removed jewellery from her hands and then she just gave a nod to the conductor and played the first note. And by this time it didn't matter what note she played because the audience was already totally given <laughs> over to the wish that she would astound, to the wish that she would succeed. And they were grateful to be there Yes. In the Sanctuary of Art. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Harriet Cohn, there is a medal given out every year, the Harriet Cohn Medal, uh, to uh, pianists, and that's given in England. And um, she was quite a woman in that she was not only this great performer, but a musician that played m contemporary music. She was the inspiration for the major piano works and gave the first performances of very difficult piano music by Sir Arnold Bax. And Bax uh, wrote very thickly and very awkwardly and she had such a small little hand and yet she could accommodate it to this kind of texture. We're going to hear the great Spanish pianist Alicia de la Rocha playing by Bach a chorale a work called Beloved Jesus We Are Here and it is in an arrangement by Harriet Cohen.
Beloved Jesus, we are here. An arrangement from a Bach cantata by Harriet Cohen, the woman we were just discussing with my guest, Quentin Crisp, the composer Bach and Alicia De La Rocha, the artist. One or two spots, as they call them in radio, commercials, and we will be back with more discussion and music. My guest today, Quentin Crisp. This is David Dubal, and I am delighted to have here on this beautiful day Quentin Crisp, who in one week on December 17th will open in Professor Eric Bentley's new play, Lord Alfred's Lover, which will be at the New Vic Theater, 13th and 14th Streets, uh, on 2nd Avenue, between those two streets, I imagine. And uh, it's going to be uh, about Oscar Wilde, who is a man that seems to follow you around. And this is true because he had a lot to say about style. Um, Almost none of it uh, is what I myself agree with. Mm -hmm. I think he did think of style as being a sort of richness, a, a decoration of rather banal material with bejeweled phrases. Mm -hmm. Um, This makes his poetry almost unreadable now. Yes, it's true. But, uh, and of course, someone in one of his plays says, in matters of great importance, it is not sincerity that counts, but style. Mm -hmm. But of course, if he'd been a real stylist, he would have known they were the same thing. Mm Mm-hmm. You only know what someone really means if their style is so perfect that everything has been shredded away except the meaning. Mm-hmm. And this, in as I see it, should be uh, the judgment by, with, that you pass on style in all respects. Mm-hmm. Everything should be shredded away from your appearance, but what you feel you really are. Mm-hmm. So that that, to me, is the essence of style is sincerity. But that does not mean spontaneity. You see, the English feel, perhaps many people feel, that um, if you considered what you're saying, you can't really be saying what you mean. Hmm. This is absolute nonsense. It's not until you've considered what you're saying that you can be sure you're saying what you really mean. Mm If you speak without due thought, you're liable to express what you feel, Mm -hmm. which is always a mistake, Mm -hmm. because we have to survive our emotions. Mm -hmm. So emotions are not reasons. Emotions are not reasons. Mm. They are forces, but not reasons. Yes, they're energy machines. Yes. So so Oscar Wilde, in a sense, did not consider often... The, uh, the sincerity, the actual, uh, the emotions were moving him. He, in his trial, he said, I seldom mean what I write, or something like that. Yes. Mm-hmm. That and, was a mistake. And that was a mistake, as I see it. Mm-hmm. But so mysterious was his blindness as to what his life was really like that he actually imagined he could make these jokes Mm -hmm. in the middle of a trial which was already going against him. Yes. And and that he could succeed. Did him in. Yeah, totally. He thought his flair level would get him out of trouble. Yes, in a court of law. I Mm. mean, it's nonsense. Yes. So in a way, he did not survive that prison sentence at all. It did him in. It really did him in. And it's hard to think why. He was... Uh, less than 40, I think, or just 40, when he went in. He was only there two years. I've known people who were in prison twice as long as that. And when they came out, they went on with their lives, shaken, mm-hmm. but they went on with them. Well, he's obviously an example of a man who, who really did not see reality. He thought that he could use those two years as a wonderful, wonderful uh, publicity stunt afterwards for the rest of his life. When he actually got into the reality of it, he couldn't take it. He couldn't take it. I don't know whether he didn't believe he would um, ever go to jail or whether he thought he would receive such preferential treatment when he was in jail. Mm -hmm. But certainly he simply was absolutely destroyed by the crudity of the conditions in jail. Yes. Uh, 
Is this a very serious play? It is a very serious play. Um, whether people will um, find it, there are moments of humour. Whether people will find it uh, appealing in other, in any other way than it may excite their pity. Mm-hmm. And this, I think, it may, which of course is one of the essences of Greek drama, was to excite the pity of the audience. We're discussing the fact that my guest today, Quentin Crisp, will be um, opening in a play by Eric Bentley, Lord Alfred's Lover, which is about Oscar Wilde as well, and uh, that will be uh, uh, Friday the 17th, and it will run until January 9th, and I'm looking forward to that um, play. We have been discussing today... uh, many things, especially uh, performance style, and we're going to conclude with a piece of music that the composer himself hated. His name, Ethelbert Nevin. He was born in Pittsburgh. He didn't live too long, around 42. He wrote a song called The Rosary, which sold a million copies in 1898, which was amazing then, and it's a fairly bad piece of music. And he wrote a piano piece called Narcissus to the uh, flower, and that became a very big stylish piece for all the people to play at home. And one of its before, of course... uh, records everyone had to play for each other uh so uh nevin has some wonderful little cross hands in there for no reason at all but i think that with the name with the amiable tune and so forth uh it became famous well isadora duncan a real stylist got a hold of it and she danced with hoops to it what about isadora duncan oh she was indeed a very great stylist um No one ever did less on the stage than she did in most of her dances. But she said she had invented this kind of dancing. Um, She was part of this craze for the new woman, Mm -hmm. for untrammeled clothes, Mm -hmm. and uh, for a more um, useful, more adventurous, more animal life Mm -hmm. than women have lived before. And she came to represent this to people. How interesting. Anyway, she then was a performer that that understood the maxim, uh, less is more. Yes. And um, Nevin saw her dance to the piece. It's only about two minutes and two seconds. And in this case, I myself give a fairly stylish performance of it. Nevin's Narcissus, and while we were playing it, you said to me you could see your sister who played it in England many years ago, the hands crossing. 
That's right, yes. And McDowell, too, was a biggie then, to a wild rose. That's right. How interesting. Now, we're going to conclude with, you said, maybe I can solve a musical mystery about tuners. Oh, yes. All piano tuners, when they tuned your piano and played all the chords and the arpeggios and got it right, they always play The Rustles of Spring. By Sinding. Yes. Yeah. Why is that? Well, I really believe that here is a piece that has a quality of being sounding difficult and brilliant, but far more than it actually is, because Sinding knew how to place the arpeggios in the hand so conveniently that you would, and this certainly is a stylist trick, a person would be thought to be better than they really were by playing this piece, and that's the mystery solved. Quentin Crisp, Thanks for being my guest, and the best of luck in Lord Alfred's Lover, Eric Bentley's new play, which will be at the New Vic, 13th and 14th um, Street, 2nd Avenue, and it's the 17th, and it will run till January 9th. Have a great time, as you usually do. Thank you. This is David Duball. Thank you for listening. For the Love of Music, with today's host, David Dubal, WNCN Music Director. We hope you'll be with us when once again we meet to listen and exchange ideas, all for the love of music. For the Love of Music is produced by WNCN New York, GAF Broadcasting Company.